Hi everyone, this is Miss Lee Lavoie here, and this lecture will be covering freshwater ecosystems that include rivers, streams, lakes, and inland wetlands. We will, we will also cover a couple of case studies such as Chesapeake Bay and the Everglades and the importance of human impact on these freshwater ecosystems. The first thing that you guys see on the screen is that um, the definition of what the freshwater life zones look like. They cover less than 1% of the Earth's surface, as we talked about um, before with um, to compare it to the saltwater um, oceans. We have low concentration of salt, which is less than 1%. And you have two different types. You have your flowing, which is called lotic. That's a, a term that you should know, such as streams and rivers. And you have standing, which is lentic, such as ponds, lakes, inland wetlands. The biggest concept that you want to kind of understand is that freshwater ecosystems, they provide major ecological and economical uh, services that are irreplaceable reservoir of biodiversity. So in a couple of minutes or in a couple of slides, you guys are going to see a, a, um, a slide that is in your book and you want to make sure that you can memorize both the economical as well as the ecological services. Uh, we're going to start off with streams and ponds, but I wanted to show you kind of what they look like. Here are some examples of the different types. Over to your right, we have a river and then we have um, a couple of pictures of some wetlands and some lakes and some um, and some bogs and whatnot. Here you can see, this is a figure in your textbook, and I believe it's 6.14 of the natural capital of your freshwater ecosystems. On the left you have your ecological services, and on your right you have the economic services. You want to be able to memorize three of them on each side, as well as justify an explanation and make a connection with some type of relationship. So if you look at nutrient cycling of ecological services, what's the benefit? You can look at economic services for that, or nutrient cycling, and then go talk about the nutrient cycling, such as carbon or nitrogen. When we get to lakes and ponds, um, we have three different types. We have lakes, ponds, and inland wetlands. Those are electric, again, and your flowing is going to be your streams and rivers. But near lakes, pond, you have these different zones, and you want to memorize these zones. The first one is called the littoral zone. This is the top layer. It's very shallow, very similar to your tide zone in your ocean, but this is the top layer, very shallow, um, right at the border of where the, um, the shore is. You have a huge amount of biodiversity, and I'll show you a picture of it in a minute, but you have aquatic plants, you have a lot of grazing snails, you have clams, you have insects, different crustaceans. You have cattails, which you see sometimes um, in the ponds around um, here in Alabama, you have a lot of fish and amphibians. Then you go out further in the limnetic zone. This is very sunlit, so this is where you have that eutrophic zone. So you have water surface layer, it's the main photosynthetic layer, and again you have a, um, a good amount of oxygen levels, your DO, your dissolved oxygen, as well as photosynthesis rates going on here. So you have a lot of plankton and fish. Well, this is the limnetic zone, is usually where you go and fish. Then as you go deeper, you go to the profundal zone, and this is the cool, dark layer, and, you, and as you go down, you decrease that O2, so you're not going to see a lot of uh, photosynthetic uh, plants as well as animals. And then on the bottom, same thing as the ocean, is you have your benthic zone, and that's your bottom level layers. Uh, when we look at freshwater ecosystems, again, you want to make sure you can understand the different types of ecological and economical services. One thing to remember with the different zones is we have depressions. And we're going to find out a little bit about this more in stratifications in the next lecture. But just to kind of briefly summarize it, is during the summer and the winter months, those temperatures in the lake are going to, not only are they stratified, but they're going to start moving. And this equalizes the temperature um, at the depths for a little bit. But then it, um, the oxygen is brought from the surface to the lake bottom, and nutrients from the bottom are brought to the top. So you see a lot of mixing, and we've got to figure out what causes this overturning. And that I want you guys to think about, but you're going to find the answer in the next lecture. So let's talk about these zones. So here's a picture of the littoral zone. This might look familiar to you if you go um, fishing or whatnot. This uh, something similar in Decatur, Tennessee River. It's near the shore. You have rooted plants such as cattails. Uh, we have cattails here on our property, but it's, uh, it has a high biodiversity. In the limnetic zone, this is where you fish. It's open waters. It produces a lot of food with all those fish, as well as it has a high amount of O2. Then you have your profundal zone. It's your deep water. You may um, It's too dark for photosynthesis. Decrease of DO, which is dissolved oxygen. So here's a picture of what I was talking about with each layer. So you can see here, 
we have a lot of our biodiversity here in the, by the shore. As you go out to, the, which, um, to your limnetic zone, right here, this is where you have a lot of photosynthesis happening because your sun can penetrate. This is the eutrophic zone, as well as you have your profundal zone as you decrease your dissolved oxygen, and then you have your benthos zone or um, your profundal zone where it's too deep for photosynthesis to occur. When you look at your lake classification, your lake classification is going to be um, how nutrients are leveled, or not not leveled, but how nutrients are bit the availability of it. Sorry, I had a little tongue twister there. Um, you have oligotrophic lakes. These are low levels of nutrients and low NPP. Remember your net primary productivity. Um, there's not a, there's little sediment. It's deep water. You have not a lot of productivity. You have maybe trout, small smallmouth bass, uh, poorly nourished. Then you have eutrophic. Eutrophic is an excess supply of nutrients. We talked about very briefly. You have high levels of nutrients, high NPP, but then sometimes you can. Uh, get too much, and that's where you have what's called eutrophication. Um, but it's it's you have eutrophic, where again it's an excess supply of nutrients. But eutrophication is where it's way too much, and so you start to get a lot of production of photosynthesis happening. But here, right now, in your trophic, eutrophic, you have a lot of phosphates and nitrates. Shallow water, you have lots of plants and fish and nectin and plankton. Then you have mesotrophic. Mesotrophic is kind of in the middle. It's an inner intermediate. Um, between your oligotrophic and your eutrophic, and what's called um, cultural eutrophication, when I'm you know talking about the excess of these phosphates and nitrates, there's a term that they call it's at least to hyper eutrophication. But in the AP exam, they don't refer to hyper eutrophication; they just call it eutrophication. And you have two different types. You have cultural, which is what we're doing, you know, with excess fertilizers that have phosphates and nitrates, and then you have your just your natural that it happens, you know. On a regular basis, or maybe not at all. You like think of the alga uh, blooms, or your pools, or where it's green along the surface. So I'll show you. Here's a picture. On the left, you have something that is oligotrophic, low levels of nutrients, and on the right, you have too much. So this would be the hyper. But again, the AP exam doesn't use that term, the hyper eutrophic. They just called it eutrophication, and it looks green. Would you want to jump in that? I wouldn't. So here's just some more terminology. Um, now we're going to go to, and here's cultural eutrophication. This is your human inputs of nutrient from uh, urban, um, when we look at agriculture areas as we're urbanizing with cities and whatnot. All right, so the next one we're going to do is our surface water, our runoff, and our watershed. So pretty much streams and rivers. Here's some terminology you should be familiar with. Uh, surface water is that just that precipitation that does not sink into the ground or evaporate. We see a lot of times surface water um, after it rains. You have your runoff that goes into that um, that's that water that flows into streams, and we have a watershed, and that is a drainage basin. So it's a region of drainage going into a river, then that river into a river system or other body of water. We, living in Alabama, are in the Tennessee watershed, so it's all those rivers and streams go into one basin of water, and that's the Tennessee watershed. So that's something important to know here. Just a little. Um, note about Alabama is Alabama we are in the water wars with Georgia and Tennessee there are certain um, areas of water and rivers that we're trying to tap into um, and this is because we feel that we own it uh, so does Georgia and so does Tennessee it's called the tri-state wars however the uh, what is it the highest court or your Supreme Court level I guess you can say uh, with regards to these three states will not hear any type of argument unless that state has a water conservation plan. Guess what state in the all of the United States does not have a water conservation plan? And you guessed it, Alabama. So that's something to consider as well as with the watershed. Um, a, a couple of little things more about streams and rivers. Your streams and rivers are going to be characterized by flow, and that is the fresh water that may originate from underground springs or as runoff from rain or melting snow. We have uh, typically we have narrow or streams are typically narrow and carry small amounts of water. Rivers are typically wider and carry larger amounts of water. And it's not always clear, however, at what point in particular a stream becomes a river um, or when it becomes large it becomes a river. So you don't have to really worry about that for the exam. 
And as water flow changes, those communities of biological species and just the biodiversity is going to change as well. Um, you have most streams have rapidly flowing rivers, and I'm going to show you that really quickly here. So the first thing that we have is a headwater stream. These characteristics, they're turbulent, they're shallow, cold, they dissolve large amounts of oxygen, and it tastes really good. So if anybody's ever had um, stream water or spring water from the mountains, it's ac ex excellent. It does taste different than your typical water from a bottle or from your tap. But you have large amounts of oxygen, again, present. Fish are also present. Example, trout. Go to this next one. Then you have downstream characteristics. This is where you have a lot of human activities. Um, unfortunately, humans degrade it and they destroy it. You know, hurricanes, natural disasters. Um, as you go downhill, though, um, as these characteristics or these rivers and streams go downhill, they're going to shape land where they pass. Um, they collect rock and soil and are deposited as sediment in low-lying areas. And we'll talk about sediment um, downstream uh, when we talk about dams as well. But here you can see in the pictures we have slower moving water, it's less oxygen, it's warmer temperatures, and you have lots of algae and cyanobacteria. So again, here are some of the zones. You have what's called a source zone. These are narrow headwaters. Water moves from rapid to clear water. Again, you have high DO. Example, again, is this picture. So that's going to be your source zone. Then you have a transition zone where it's wider and deeper, slower, and your lower DO. Then you have your floodplain zone, and that's going to be where water and lower DR are very muddy. So let me kind of show you what it might look like here. This is where we're going from our freshwater streams down to our, um, to our other streams, to rivers, and to mountains and oceans. And this would be kind of like what's called a watershed because it's shedding into one large basin. And water is flowing from the mountains to the sea, and you have different, again, you have different ecosystems and, um, or conditions and habitats. Precipitation that does not sink into the ground, evaporate, again, it's called surface water, and it becomes runoff when it flows into streams. Um, this watershed you see here is, again, that land that delivers runoff in three different zones, so you can see the hill. You have your mountain, again, up here, is going to be your headwater. You have your transition zone, where it becomes larger and wider, uh, lower elevation, streams and floodplains and rivers down in here, and then eventually, oops, there we go, it's going to empty out into the ocean. Okay, so the last thing we're going to talk about is the freshwater wetlands, those vital sponges. But before we get to that, we're going to talk a little bit about the impacts of freshwater ecosystems that humans, um, how they impact it. There, um, you have a couple things. You have cities, dams, farm, farmlands, uh, filled wetlands, alter. They degrade the freshwater habitats. And when we look at dams such as the largest one, you need to know for the exam, it's in China, the Three Gorge Dam. You have the Hoover Dam. You have all these different, you have over about 500 dams here in the United States. And um, they have changed and they diverted water. They changed habitats. We look at sediment downstream, how it's changed. Uh, we have flood control levees. Um, when we think about certain case studies, such as dams reducing sediments in deltas, you have what, what's the importance of it. You have New Orleans, the Hurricane Katrina, how their levees broke. Um, global warming, the sea rising in New Orleans. So these are some things to think about as uh, impacts of humans on freshwater ecosystems. So let's finish up very quickly with our freshwater wetlands. We talked about wetlands before, but this are now our inland. These act like a sponge, just like the coastal ones. They absorb and store your excess water. They um, store pollutants or filter those pollutants, and they have a lot amount of wildlife and habitat. I'm just going to get to my notes real quick. Um, they have a, provide a huge, here, um, you have high amount of biodiversity. They have um, a lot of ecological and economic services, such as filtering and degrade toxic waste, which is huge, reducing floods um, and erosion. You have um, helping to replenish streams and recharge ground aquifers. We'll talk about that a little bit more later in another chapter. Biodiversity, you have food and timber. You also have recreation areas. Uh, one third of all endangered bird species are going to find their life in some time. Um, they're going to spend some part of their life in, in wetlands. So that's something to consider too because it's, 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 we should save it just because, because of aesthetic purpose. And that's something that you can do in environment, environmental sciences. That's something that you can write for the exam is that you can save something for if it's just its beauty. So here are some pictures. 
Uh, let's give you some examples. We have our, I already talked about this one. I talked about that. These are just what I uh, just listed. Um, some of the things that cycle through your freshwater ecosystems or your wetlands, uh, carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, you use at, for agriculture. It's limited, so it's limiting nutrient. It's going to be O2 content as well as temperature, so that's something to consider, um, as well as access to photosynthesis because it can be shady in certain areas, especially our swamps. So here's an example of a marsh. It's an area that's temporarily flooded, often uh, silty land besides a river or a lake. Um, I've seen this before um, in the Tennessee River where you have the river and then you have areas that uh, might be flooded with water and then it's, it's dry. You have your swamps. I've seen this right in front of Heritage. This is a lowland region that's permanently covered with water. I'm sure a lot of snakes, diamond heads or whatever, that could be crawlers that are in there. You have your hardwood bottom, uh, bottomland forest. I see a little bit of this down by a river or stream. Um, I'm not sure where the stream is right next to James Clemens, but there is, there, I believe there is a small one that goes through the front of it. There's some woods right between us and McDonald's, that wood pack, uh, between that and the, um, that next neighborhood. But you can see a lot of hardwoods like this and oaks that grow. It's kind of cool to walk through if it wasn't so cold. Um, it's a, actually a nice walk to go in those woods. Here's a prairie. These are depressions that hold water out of the prairie, especially up north in Canada and it's a very good duck habitat. And this is peat moss bog. This is cool. I want to know if you can know what this picture is. And if you can tell me, I'll give you a piece of candy. This is a wet area that over time fills in. It's the last stage of succession um, is peat moss. So, um, so what happens here, it can, be, it can be very deep. And in Ireland, they burn this for wood. And I want, I want uh, somebody to tell me why I have this picture up. And the first person who does tells me, you will get a piece of candy. So the importance of freshwater ecosystems or these wetlands, again, the biggest, they filter and purify water. It's a, and it's a habitat for many animals. The historical abset, um, aspects of it, uh, when, when we look at this, I'm just going to kind of read you a couple things from it. Uh, developers and farmers want Congress to revise the definition of a wetland. This would make 60 to 75 percent of all wetlands unavailable for protection. Um, the Audubon Society estimates, like I was stating briefly before, water, uh, these wetlands provide about protection worth $1.6 billion per year. And if they say if wetlands are destroyed, which is the United States is doing, we would spend $7.7 .7 billion to $31 billion per year in additional flood cost control. So pretty much it's cheaper to um, protect it and develop it than it is to take them away and then have to fix everything from the floods. Again, we talked about estuaries. I just want to um, go back one more time. It's where your coastal water is going to uh, mix with fresh water. Some, again, your examples, salt marshes, mangroves, and the importance of estuaries. The, next, the case studies that we're going to talk about right now is the Everglades. Okay, this is the southern Florida Keys. And this case study that you should be familiar with for the AP exam. It's the world's largest ecological restoration. 90% of the park awaiting birds have vanished. Um, other vertebrates populations are down. Uh, large volumes of water that once flowed are down because they've been diverted to crops. We're seeing an increase of invasive species such as the python. They're doing a contest right now to, um, to catch pythons. I think they're at 40 right now, but they're killing off a lot of their species. Uh, runoff is called a lot of noxus, which is, again, um, very toxic algal blooms. So here's the problem. In Miami, um, it, it enroaches on uh, the Everglades. Plus, you have a lot of people versus wildlife, and freshwater local areas are draining it. So they're trying to fix it. They're trying to restore it, and here's what they're trying to do. Here's a map of it. And they're trying to restore it. So they're trying to, uh, one way to do it is to build a huge aqueduct or find other sources where you can protect those federal species, endangered species. The other one is going to be Chesapeake Bay. I'm going to get to my notes on Chesapeake Bay real quick, so please bear with me. Chesapeake Bay comes up quite frequently on the exam. And Chesapeake Bay was in 1983. Wait, I'm going to find it. There we go. Um, it's the largest estuary in the United States. It was, it's been polluted since 1960. 
um, and this is because the population has increased. You have different types of pollution, point and non-point sources. Um, we'll talk about pollution much more, but just to give you an idea of what those mean, is point, uh, point source solution, excuse me, pollution, is where you know where it's coming from. You have a tank spill, or you have um, some type of nuclear, you know exactly where it's coming from. However, with a non-point, you don't, such as air pollution. So with Chesapeake Bay, you want to be familiar with it for the exam. Um, so those, we'll talk about point and non-point um, way down the line uh, when we get to pollution. We also have um, in Chesapeake the phosphate and the nitrate levels were too high. Um, in the Chesapeake Bay area in 1983, they started the Chesapeake Bay program, and this was to update um, the recovery on the bay. So that's something to know about um, is, is this or, or these two, the Everglades. So that's pretty much it for this lecture. I'm sorry it was long, but I needed to get you the information. And now you can watch or you can pause me as many times as you want. So the next and the last lecture is going to be a small part on stratification for lakes. So don't forget about that because that's been on the exam. Have a good night.